Uh, yeah, so like Darren was saying, uh, my name's Nick, uh, Nick Taylor. I'm from Montreal, Quebec, Canada, so east coast of Canada. Uh, like he said, too, I'm one of the leads at uh, Forum. Um, if you're looking for me anywhere online, I'm pretty much at Nikki T online everywhere. Um, you can also check out my site, iamdeveloper.com, and I also stream on Twitch. Uh, you can check that out at livecoding.ca or twitch.tv slash thepracticaldev. Uh, and I'm also not a big fan of spiders. Um, cool. So, uh, yeah, so what we'll cover today is why knowing your tools is important. We're going to talk about some tools. These are tools that I use every day. Um, so I'm going to share some, some little knowledge nuggets there from all these things. Uh, so we're going to go through VS Code a bit. Uh, I'm going to talk about the GitHub CLI, so the command line interface for GitHub. Uh, then we're going to look into browser tooling. Uh, we're going to do all kinds of stuff like inspecting elements, look at the CSS panel. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff in there. There's also an accessibility panel, which uh, we'll take a peek in there too. And just a few other things like the command palette, the sources panel, and then we'll get into debugging some JavaScript in the browser. And from there, what we're going to do is we're also going to do some debugging of JavaScript in VS Code. And we're going to wrap it up with uh, how to be a detective. So just some debugging techniques uh, uh, that I'll share with all of you. Um, OK, so uh, let's get to it. So why is knowing your tools important? Um, one reason is productivity. If you know your tools better, like shortcuts, uh, you know, you know how to do something because you know how the tool works, uh, the productivity will, is definitely a, a, a big win. Um, depending on what the tools are, it can help you diagnose problems. Um, it also, they can also help you understand the systems you work in. And of course, as developers, we all like to customize things. So you got to be able to set that favorite font in your editor or terminal. So you need to learn how to do that too. Um, anyways, that was a bad joke. Sorry. Um, okay, let's, uh, let's get to tools. Okay, so um, tools are super important. And before we even go into talking about some tools, um, one thing that I find useful, and this happens on Twitter a lot, where I am a lot in a lot of the developer communities, but like people always be like, oh, what's that thing you're using? And then somebody will be like, oh, well, check out my uh, uses page. So there's this concept of a uses page. And so like, for example, here's mine on my website, and it's a list of all the stuff I use from my editor, extensions, and so on. Uh, I also talk about like my desk setup and stuff. And this is something that not everybody does, but there's a bunch of folks that do this. Uh, and also, um, in terms of sharing, Wes Boss, who's uh, pr pretty well known in the web developer community, he created this uh, project called uses.tech. And this is literally a page where people from all over the world that are developers just share the things they use. So I'd highly encourage you to check that out if you're looking for new tools or maybe other things that could help you do your work. So definitely check that stuff out. Um, cool. All right, so we're gonna start off with VS Code. So VS Code is Visual Studio Code. It's a Microsoft product, but it is open source. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through some quick tips, uh, maybe go over a few shortcuts, uh, it's not a super long talk, so I can't really go super deep into a lot of things, but I also want to share a few extensions I use. So the first things that I find are super useful, and I'm just going to move the little screen of the me and Darren there. Um, so you have all these things on the side here. So I have my toolbar set to the right, but it defaults to the left. But you have like the Explorer pane. This is where your files are normally. You can search for things. This is a Git tab and so on. And um, sometimes when you're working, like if I open up a project and, and this is kind of tying into the useful Git extensions, this is, a, this is an extension called Project Manager. So these are different projects I work on. So for example, if, if I open up uh, Forum, you're gonna see the, all the code here load up on the side. Now I can switch and I can search, uh, search and all kinds of stuff. Um, but there's also keyboard shortcuts to do these things. So 
one thing that I do a lot is if I just open this file here. So I, I'm also zoomed in right now just because we're uh, doing a stream here. Um, but let me just hide this. So like if I'm working, I'm like, well, that's sidebar. It's like I can't really see much. So I want to hide it. And you can click on the icons here to do that. Um, but there's another thing you can do, which is if you press Command B, or if you're on a non-Mac machine, Control B, you can just toggle showing and hiding it. Um, there's another thing you can do, which is Command Shift E, which will go to the Explorer. You can do, for example, Command Shift D, which will go to the debugger and so on. So there's a bunch of shortcuts. Uh, I won't go into all of them. Uh, there is a link in the resources at the end of the talk, but I, I strongly encourage you to check out the shortcuts because I find it makes myself more productive. Um, so definitely check that out. Um, okay, so I'm gonna switch using the project manager extension again here. I'm gonna go to the code mentor talk project I created. There's literally nothing in here right now, um, but I'm gonna open up, I have the terminal inside here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna type in, let me just say code, and I'm gonna say index.html. Uh, there's something you can set up uh, for VS Code. Um, you can make it run from the command line as well. So if I type code index.html, it's actually gonna open the file here now. And so now I'm just gonna save it and I have a blank HTML file here. Um, when you wanna get started, if you actually do uh, exclamation mark and then you press tab, what it does is, and let me close the sidebar here, it creates a template for an HTML file. And the way that's possible is it uses something called Emmet. Emmet is its own thing, but it's actually built into Visual Studio Code. So as you get familiar with CSS, there's something called CSS selectors. Uh, Emmet is kind of powered by that. So for example, I can say, uh, I'm gonna make a UL, which is a unordered list. And then I can say, I wanna have a list item in it and I want five of them. And then I can say, I wanna have an anchor tag in there and uh, let's say a class called YOLO, so dot YOLO. Now, if I press tab now, except did I do it wrong? What did I do wrong? Hey, da, 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 da. Okay, let's go back a bit here. Hold on a sec, let's try it one more time. This is the beauty of live coding. Uh, so if I do this, <laughs> why is it not working now? Oh, okay, uh, let's do, okay. That worked. Okay, I'm clearly doing something wrong with Emmet right now. But if you type in like the element and then I could say li and then I press tab, it creates it. Uh, okay, I'm not sure what's going on right now, but there's uh, at, with Emmet, you can type like this normally. I must have disabled something and it will create like an unordered list and then it'll add a list item and so on. Um, so that was just a kind of short little tip there. Um, we're going to keep this HTML file. I'm just going to say hello, Code Mentor. I'm going to save that. And what I'm going to do is this is a new project. So uh, if you're not familiar with Git too much, I'm just going to run Git init. And this makes it initializes a repository so that we can start using Git. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say Git add and it should add my file here. So if I come over here now, it's there. And I'm gonna, I'm just gonna commit this. So I'm gonna say git commit m, and I'm gonna say uh, testing. Okay, so that commits it. So now I've, if I do, uh, if I look at the git log, we're gonna see I've made this one commit that I just did testing. Now, what we can do now is there's this other extension called Git Lens. So if I do Command Shift P and I type Git Lens, you can start seeing a list of things here. So I'm going to say show quick info. It's like everything is dying on me here. Okay. Uh, so you can see some history here. If I close the side here. All right. And there's a bunch of other things it has, but GitLens just kind of, it gives you all these tools to, to see information about uh, what you've been doing in terms of Git. So um, there's that. Okay, 
The other one that is interesting is called Git Cloak. And I'm just going to close that one. Let's, I'm going to create a file called .env. So this is an environment file, and I'm going to save it. And so I'm, environment files typically have keys that you don't want to expose to people. Uh, so uh, there's this thing called cloak, and I'm going to say show secret. So if I say hello equals secret, if I'm like streaming right now, this is like, oh no, this, is, this isn't good. You shouldn't see this. Uh, if you do uh, command shift P, which gives you this command palette, you can say cloak and you can say, I want to hide the secrets now. And then all of a sudden you see that I still see like what the key is, but I don't see the data anymore. And so this is a, a useful thing if you're streaming or doing some kind of presentation. So those are just a few things there that I wanted to show in, uh, in VS Code. There's a lot more, but again, uh, as the talk's only about 30 minutes, uh, <laughs> there's only so much you can do. So um, the next thing I want to show is the GitHub CLI. So the GitHub CLI allows you to do things like create repositories. Um, you can also create a pull request, and you can also uh, check out a pull request. We won't do all of those, but uh, if you type, uh, if you install the GitHub CLI, uh, there's links here and at the end. Uh, it gives you this at the command line called gh uh, for GitHub, and then so I can do help, and you'll just get a list of a lot of the things you can do. So what we're going to do is we're going to say GitHub repo, which is short for repository, and I'm going to say create. And I'm going to say I want to push an existing local repository. And the only reason I'm doing that is because I initialized Git before and we committed that one file. So I'm going to click that. And it's just going to say, where is the repository? It's the folder we're in right now. So I'm going to press Enter. And it's going to say repository name, code mentor. I'll say testing. And I'll make it private, not because there's anything to hide. It's just this is a demo. And then to link it to GitHub, there's something called a remote. So you can just say yes. Uh, yeah. OK. So uh, yeah, origin is the default for a remote name. So there we go. Uh, and now it's saying, do you want to push the changes you made? So I'm going to say yes. And all of a sudden, it's done that. So now if I click here, you're going to see that on my GitHub, it's pushed up the repository. And that's pretty much it. And uh, I'm going to close this. There's other things you can do, like you can say create a PR, um, so which is a pull request. I'm not going to go through that right now because that's a little bit of a longer process. But this is something I do every day when I'm ready to uh, push up a feature uh, for work or fix a bug. I'll say ghpr create. And basically, if you do that, it'll just give you steps. OK, I don't have any changes to push right now. but um, You'll, it'll just give you steps like what do you want to call it, um, what do you want to add in the description, and so on. And then it'll push it up. And then you'll end up with this as well in the repository. You'll see that there's a PR created. And you can also check out a PR uh, pull request. All right, let's move on here. OK. OK, so now we're going to talk about browser dev tooling. So uh, I'm demoing most of this. I'm in Microsoft Edge, which is a Chromium-based browser. Um, but these tools exist in Firefox, um, which have pretty much the same tooling. Uh, Safari also has tooling, but it's not as up to date as the other browsers. So we're going to, I'm just going to drag this out here. And so we're going to take a look at some of the tools here. OK, so let's start off by looking here. Did I go to the right one? OK, yeah. So we want to talk about inspecting elements. So say you're on a web page. Uh, I'm on vscodetips.com right now, which is a community I run. Um, and I'm like, oh, this doesn't look right. So I can say right click, and I can say inspect. And then you're going to see it highlights in this 
panel below in the developer tools called elements. And you're going to see that I can see the HTML that's there. And I could do things in here, like I could change it. I could say, like, I'm going to change the height to 48. I'll change it here. And then if I click outside, uh, it changes the markup. Um, the way we have our SVG set up, it's not going to resize it. But, um, but there's other interesting things you can look at here. So like um, there's flex tooling uh, for Flexbox, or if you have CSS grid, um, there's other things you can do. Like you can hide an element. Um, you can show it, you could even delete it. Um, so there's a bunch of things you can do in here. Uh, again, I'm not gonna go too deep into this right now, uh, just for sake of timing, uh, but let's keep moving on here. Uh, another one that's interesting is, I'm just gonna refresh the page here. Okay, so there's the CSS panel. So if I come here, you're gonna see on the right, and I'll just make this a bit bigger. So you can see there's all kinds of stuff going on in here. Um, there's a bunch of CSS classes and there's, uh, let's go to another page. I didn't mean to click on that link. Uh, let's say inspect here. Okay, so you can see right here, I can start toggling stuff and I can start hiding things and it alters the CSS. Um, you can even do things like uh, I can come here and I can say, I want to make the color, uh, let's see here, I can say color, and I'll say blue. And I can alter it. And you can see all of a sudden, I've altered the CSS here. Uh, and this is stuff that's handy when you want to try out things. And you can, again, like other things here, you can toggle it on and off. Um, another thing that's interesting in the CSS panel is you can come over here to this computed tab and you can see stuff like, uh, okay, well, why is the background color this color? And it shows you exactly what's setting it. So you can click on it and then it'll say it's in this file like here. And this is useful when you have problems with CSS where you're like, I set it to like green, but why is it, you know, why is it this color? And a lot of times something like that is because of, uh, it's out of the scope of this talk, but like CSS specificity or the order of things. And when you look in the computed one, it'll tell you like what's the one that won, like that decided that it's this. Uh, yeah. Uh, so aside from that, there's also uh, grid and flex box tools, which if we come here, uh, where is it? Okay. So you can see here, uh, this particular element is a uh, flex box and you can all of a sudden start changing the properties here just to test out stuff. And you can see it's moving stuff around. So this is another handy thing. Uh, there's also for grid, but this particular one doesn't have a grid element. Um, the other thing we can look in here is this is hidden away sometimes, depending on your screen size. Um, but the accessibility tree is something interesting. So uh, again, out of the scope of the talk accessibility, but screen readers will read things to you and you can see what the actual text is. Uh, you can alter things here. So it's it's a good way to see like when you're trying to test out things with accessibility, the accessibility tree is super useful. Okay, cool. Uh, okay, the other things, so like if you use the editor like VS Code or another one, just like in those editors, if you do Command P or Control P, you can start looking for files and then you can open them. There's a file tree on the left, but this is a faster way to do this. All right, um, there's also the sources panel. So this is like when you find a file, this is where you'll see the source code. Uh, yeah, okay, cool. Uh, yes, uh, T. Williams was saying that T, uh, the flex and grid shortcuts are really awesome in Chrome. Um, yeah, no, I strong agree. Okay, cool, uh, let's move on here. Okay, uh, I know that was a lot to go through, um, but uh, we're gonna look at debugging things now. So this is JavaScript and you have uh, debugging tools built into your browser. So for example, uh, we're on this, I'm gonna go to an article just cause I, I know this page well. Uh, let's go to subscription. Yeah. So 
you can see here, there's something called breakpoints you can put. So uh, it makes these things blue here. Uh, if I refresh, you're going to see that the code stops. And then all of a sudden, I can see what's happening in, in this particular case. I'm in a Preact component, which is like React. And I can start going through things. And I can see the values of things. Uh, there's a way to see all, everything over here. Uh, like what's in the local scope and so on. There's like a huge amount of tooling in here. So uh, definitely lots of great stuff in here. Um, adding a breakpoint is one way you can do it. You can also add an explicit word called debugger, um, which is super helpful too sometimes. I, I tend to use the breakpoints. Now, one thing I wanna show you here is I'm gonna put a breakpoint again and I'm gonna refresh the page. It's going to come here. Now, let's see here. On us is logged in. Subscription type. So subscription type right now is all comments. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do something called a conditional breakpoint. So uh, here I can say, uh, what is it? Subscription type. Is it here? All comments. This dot state. Yeah. Hold on a sec. If I do this dot state dot, uh, what was it? Subscription type. Oh, why can't I see it? Okay, let's do something else here. Um, yeah, I don't know why it's not doing it, but let's put it here. So let's do this. Let's refresh again here. Um, but basically, you can put conditions. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something silly here, but I'm going to say stop when it's true, OK? Um, this is obviously a very trivial thing, um, just putting true. Uh, let me type that back in. OK, so now you see it changes color. And I'm going to refresh. It's going to stop there because the condition is true. So imagine if you had some kind of condition where you'd want to stop. Uh, because say you're going through a loop a thousand times and you only want to stop once. So um, just to show this, I'm going to change it to false. It's still going to be a conditional breakpoint. I'm going to refresh the page. And OK, this is another breakpoint, sorry. And it's not going to stop on that orange one anymore because it's no longer ending up being true. So conditional breakpoints can be something super useful, too. Um, Another thing you can do is called log points. This is something that Visual Studio Code introduced and the browsers actually ended up doing it. So I can say, uh, for example, hello. Now you see it turns pink. Now I'm going to clear the console here. I'm going to refresh the page. And you see how it logs out hello. Now. You might say like, okay, whatever, big deal. But the, the thing that's interesting here is instead of adding console.logs into your code, you can actually just do it in the debugger and you can just uh, edit, uh, edit it. And in this case, it's a log point. You can switch it to the type conditional or breakpoint. So those are just some other interesting things that you can do in the browser in terms of debugging. All right, we're gonna move on here because I know we're running uh, short on time here. OK, let's come over here. I'm going to grab some code. And we're going to go to VS Code. So we're going to say clear. I'm going to say code index.js. And we're going to do npm. Whoops. I'm going to install uh, a package for npm. I just need to initialize npm. Uh, this is going to just set it up with defaults. So I'm going to do npm install express. Express is a, a lightweight uh, web framework. Uh, so let's, there we go. And I'm just going to copy some code. Just got to move the chat out of the way one second here. All right, there we go. OK. So I'm going to paste this code in and save this. Uh, let's get out of here. Let's 
close the file history. Let's close the side here. So this is just, oops, didn't mean to open that. There we go. Uh, so this is uh, a lightweight web server. It's just, we're gonna go to a, uh, like a particular website URL and it's gonna load up. So I'm just gonna start the web server. So I'm gonna say node, which allows you to run a node.js file. And I'm gonna run node index.js. This is gonna open up this. If I come over to slash yo, you're gonna see that the web page is running now. Now that's great. Now, one thing that's interesting is you can debug Node.js as well. Uh, and I'm gonna do something dash dash inspect dash brk, which means inspect and stop right away. So I'm gonna run that. And you're gonna see that it says it's got a debugger listening. I'm gonna open up the dev tools. Now you're gonna see something slightly different now. There's this green hexagon. And this green hexagon is the Node.js debugger. So I'm gonna click on that. And you're gonna see over here, it opens it up. And it looks like the regular browser dev tools, but all of a sudden uh, with the break that I did, the inspect dash break, you're in the Node.js file debugging the, the backend code in the browser. So this is pretty interesting, I find. Um, so for example, and all the things like we were showing before, you can put breakpoints just like you were doing before. So if I just run this, uh, let's see here, yo, yo star, okay. Oh yeah, I've got to rerun it, sorry. So if I rerun this, you're gonna see all of a sudden I'm in the backend code and I'm debugging things. And again, you have all the same tools that you did before. You, you can see the breakpoints, you can see the local scope here with all the variables and stuff. You have the console. So for example, I can say, you know, what's the count? It's zero currently. I could even do count plus plus, uh, you know, and then I could look at the count again and then it's one. So this is really interesting. You, you have access to all these debugging tools for backend code right in the browser. Uh, so that's just another uh, interesting thing I find. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and close this. Okay, so I'm just gonna come back to uh, here and I'm gonna stop. Okay, now the last thing I wanna show here before we get into some tips of debugging tips is, uh, yeah, we can, we can debug in the browser, but you can also debug in VS Code. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna clear again and I'm gonna do the same thing I did before. I'm gonna say no dash dash inspect dash brk. Oh, I still got this open. Hold on a sec. Let's close this and let's close that. Okay. So we can see this is open now. Um, what I'm gonna do at this point is I'm going to go back to the local host 3000 and let's put, I have my breakpoint in there. Good. So now what I'm gonna do is there's this debug panel. And I can say just run and debug. And I can say Node.js. And okay, address already in use. Sorry, let's uh, let's add a configuration here. So there's something called a launch.json file in VS Code. And this allows you to add different configurations for any kind of debugging, not just Node.js. So I'm gonna add one that's called Node.js attach. What this means is I can have something in node running and then I can just decide when I wanna debug it. So I'm just gonna close that and I'm gonna press F5 now, which starts the debugger. And all of a sudden I'm debugging again here. And if I refresh the page, it should, uh, what's going on here? Hold on a sec. Let me just stop it and start it again. And let's go to attach. Sorry, I was on the wrong one. So now when I go attach, all of a sudden I'm in VS Code, just like I was in the browser before, and I can debug things like I was before. So, and I, you can do, and in VS Code, you can do all the things you had there too. So you can add a breakpoint, edit it uh, to make it conditional or add a log point, et cetera. So now if I run this, I'm refreshing a page and it's saying uh, there's a, 
it's there's a thing here detecting if it's even or not and I output different messages and this is where it gets interesting so the counts one so I could say you know let's add a conditional breakpoint and let's say count equals three so this is only going to stop when it's three and you can see the debug breakpoint changes a bit so I'm going to refresh this uh, let me undo this one okay and then let it run Okay, it didn't stop there. I'm gonna refresh it again. You can see on the right side, if I zoom in a bit, it's uh, it's still two. I'm gonna refresh now. The count is three. And that's why the, the conditional breakpoint stopped. So this is just like super short showing this because uh, it is, uh, we only have 30 minutes and I've already gone over a few minutes. Um, but I just wanted to show you that you not only can you use the browser for debugging front end, JavaScript code. You can also use it for debugging backend JavaScript code in Node.js, and you can do the same thing in VS Code as well. So I'm going to just stop that there. We're going to head back to the slides. And let me just move this over. Um, yeah, so uh, we're, we're close to time here. Uh, I, well, we definitely have time for questions, um, but I kind of wanted to go over some things that are like it's, it's kind of a cheesy, like how to be a detective, but I really do think as a programmer, you know, you are kind of a detective. You're trying to figure out that bug, you're trying to solve something. So it's, it, it really makes sense to me. And some of these things might sound obvious, but you'd be surprised the amount of times I've said some of these things to people and they're like, oh, that's a great idea. Um, get good at Googling for real. It's, it's, it's a really a skill. Uh, I know people say it all the time, but uh, I can give you some concrete examples. Say you get an error in your project and you're like, okay, it's saying error, something, something, something. Google that error. I, I guarantee you at least one person on the planet has had this issue and it's going to show up, uh, whether it's on Stack Overflow, a Dev2 post or somewhere else. Um, so definitely, definitely, definitely do that. Yeah, T, T. Williams is saying, yeah, definitely Google first. It's, it's literally the first thing I do. Even as somebody who's more senior, I, I'm Googling stuff all the time. Uh, so that's super important. Uh, these are more practical things. Like when I'm like tasked with working on a bug or a new feature, and I'm not familiar with something in the code, I'll look for a piece of text on the website and then I'll go like, okay, I'm going to search the code base for that piece of text. And usually that'll lead me to maybe a template if it's like a web development project. And then I can see how's that template loaded. And then I can kind of just kind of slowly follow uh, a trail of like where everything starts. So that's something I do a lot. Um, definitely use the log logging and, and the debugger. Not everybody debugs and that's okay. Like having console logs littered everywhere is totally okay too. Um, one thing I always say about being productive or using your tools is do what works best for you. Something I say might not resonate with you. Um, so, you know, uh, do what works best for you. But I found both of those to be super handy. Another one which it might sound obvious, but like when you're not making progress on something, just step away, you know, you know, take a quick nap, go for a walk, work out, whatever, you know, grab a shower. Your, your brain's always thinking. So, you know, you'll just be out for your walk and then your, your brain's slowly going to be marinating this problem. And then I can't guarantee it always fixes the issue, but, you know, strong, strong chances are something, something's going to unlock a little bit at least. Um, the other thing I find super important is rubber ducking your problem. So if you're not familiar with what rubber ducking is, it's literally like a duck. So this is a little, this is a, a corgi duck, but, um, but basically you talk to some kind of inanimate object and explain the problem, talk through it. It sounds super silly, but just talking things through is super helpful. And um, the other thing too, is you can just talking to somebody else or, you know, we're, we're more remote these days. So like a lot of stuff's written right out, you know, like, this is what I tried. This is what I did. A lot of times when you write it out or, or, or just say it out loud, some things you're like, Oh, that's why I, I can't tell you how many times uh, it's happened to me where I won't answer somebody in Slack right away. Uh, I'll just let them ask the question. And then a lot of times, like 10 minutes later, they're like, Oh, never mind, I figured it out because they had written it out. 
So just some some practical things here. Um, yeah, Benton's saying uh, he chats with his coworker and half the time they figure it out just explaining things. So yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that. Uh, another thing which you don't have to do all the time, but sometimes I draw things out. Uh, I mean, I'm doing web development and a lot of front end stuff, but I don't mean like literally draw out the design. I mean, like, you're like, okay, well, when it's this, you know, like, okay, this is what happens. And sometimes just drawing things out can help as well. You know, uh, I'm not saying you have to create some super professional flow chart or whatever, but just drawing or, or writing things down can help too. And the other thing is, the more experience you get, you're going to draw on your past experiences. You're going to be working on a problem. You're going to be like, Oh yeah, I remember two years ago I was on this other project, not exactly the same thing, but I remember this, you know. So your your storing your knowledge is is definitely a good thing. And this ties into something that is completely unrelated to this talk, but anything you learn or problems you figure out, I highly encourage you to blog about it because one, it'll help other people, but also you might end up coming to your own blog one day too, because you are searching for the answer to a problem. So uh definitely do that as well. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much the end of the talk. I know we're, I went over uh, <laughs> a little bit there, um, but uh, I have a bunch of resources that I encourage you all to check out. The slide deck is going to be available at imdeveloper.com slash codementor2022. Uh, Darren's going to share that uh, once the recording's out, I believe. And aside from that, uh, do we have any other questions? Uh, I know there was a lot to absorb there, so uh, no worries if you need a, a minute or two. Um, cool, cool. Oh yeah, no problem, Deepika. No problem, glad to help. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks so much, Nick. You know, I've heard of a lot of these tools before, but I, mean, I feel like with these tools, they're always new tricks. Um, it really some of the practical advice at the end, like with debugging, yeah, it's like how many times I just, you know, bang my head on the, on the wall for a day, but the next day, I, you know, yeah. I slept and so, like, oh, that's how it is. It ran back to my computer and then, you know, that was it. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's, it's just so yeah. true. Um, yeah, we got a few questions. Um, if, if you all have questions, feel free to keep putting in the Q and A, um, but we got a little time here. Um, no yeah. worries, but yeah, you all have to go like, yeah. Totally fine. So Andy yeah. had this question for, yeah, I think I think he put it in pretty, pretty early. So Andy asks, what's the best web script debugging app that should be used, especially when you need to resize and shape images to fit certain frames? Do you have an idea? Yeah, uh, like responsive images. Well, uh, that'd be using like media queries and CSS, but there are, the, there's, there's a few tools out there that allow you to test your your browser in different sizes. There's one called, um, what the heck's it called? Uh, it's from a, a someone on on Twitter online called Kitsa. It's it's oh, what, there's another one called Polyplane, which allows you to view things in different formats, so you can work on it, making sure that you know your site is responsive in, in several views and stuff. It's it's not necessarily for resizing the image itself but you you could use stuff like for example like somebody mentioned cloudinary at the beginning cloudinary does resizing and stuff uh it's also good at serving different image formats for example like if your browser supports webp which most of them do like say you your thing was actually jpeg it'll actually serve the better format for that browser and you can also use the query string to resize things uh I haven't used Cloudinary too, too much. We use it at Dev2, I know, but um, that's super helpful. But for an actual tool to just doing the different sizes, a lot of that, I think it's 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 knowing how the, the markup in the CSS works. So becoming familiar with media queries, there's something on images called the SRC set attribute, which allows you to uh, have several image format sizes. Uh, Based, and then basically the browser looks at that and goes, okay, well, the size is this, so I'm going to serve up this particular image size. Um, yeah, so I don't know if that completely answers their question or not, but. Yeah, no worries. Um, okay, uh, Deepika is asking a question. Yeah, I think, so the, the gist of this is, um, you know, Deepika is looking for, for jobs and also 
you know, just opportunities, but then, you know, she also wants to, to keep up with the coding skills, uh, working on .NET Core. Um, okay. I think she's looking for any, any advice that maybe just on top of your head, um, in terms of how to get, how to get started, how do you, how do you, you know, develop? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I know for, I haven't done .NET in a while. I, I stopped doing .NET in 2016, but, uh, uh, you know dotnet core and all that it's all open source now there's tons of resources there's really good people you should follow like scott hanselman uh i think he's s hanselman on twitter he's pretty active there um check out the there's the channel nine for microsoft stuff um i, I i've been out of the dotnet ecosystem for a while but uh and in terms of jobs or even just help uh, I mean, I work in community software and I would strongly suggest finding communities. Uh, I'm a part of a really awesome community called Virtual Coffee uh, that I go to usually once or twice a week. Um, there's a bunch of discords. There's a really great one for open source. Uh, it's called Open Sauce. It's by Brian, Brian Douglas, from, who's the director of developer advocacy at GitHub. He had started that project, um, you know, just, just asking questions. Uh, you know, there's tons of communities out there. The, the Code Newbie community is great too. Uh, Dev Two, obviously, I will I will shamelessly plug them because I, I even before I worked there, I was using the Dev Two community. But it, it is a great resource. Uh, I know some people like Hashnode as well. Um, that's another uh, great resource if you're looking to do blogging and just uh, you know get development tips. Um, and job boards, uh, it varies. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, Tom, oh, Thomas is asking, what do you use Dev2 for? Um, well, for myself, uh, I use Dev2. I, I blog there. I also, the, the stuff I blog there, I use it kind of like as a headless CMS for my own blog. So like when I write stuff on Dev2, it, it helps update my blog. But it's... There's just tons of resources in there, you know, uh, lots of great stuff. Uh, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of web developer stuff, but there's people in there that do other things like, uh, you know, Python, uh, Elixir, like basically any languages you can think of, somebody's written something on there. Uh, so yeah, that that's what I would say I use Dev2 for, uh, Toma. Uh, nice. Yeah, sorry, go ahead, Darren. Um, yeah, no, I, I think, I think just gonna say I think Nick's gonna got somewhere to go afterward after this. Um, so yeah, thank you all for for the questions. And I'm gonna, you know, I think just encourage you. Like, oh yeah, Nick already has it up. Just you, where you can find him on social media. Um, you can also go to our event page and leave a comment for him. I think I think he's also gonna be able to see that. But yeah, let's keep the conversation going. Um, I think this is just like a great intro to to a lot of things. But um, yeah, and also yep. that the, the recording will be available most realistically um, Monday because, you know, we got to do some edits uh, with my team, but it will be available and I can also post um, Nick's slides on the on the event page later today. So, yeah, perfect. yeah um, just a quick announcement. Um, I, I'm going to put all the links and everything in the chat. Um, but we have an event next week. It's uh, on progressive web apps and it's also like intro level talk. So, yeah, if you haven't heard of it, we've done it. Um, that's that would be that might be interesting for you since we we're talking about web development today. But let me put the links yeah. in the chat right now. Um, yeah, so there's a couple of them, but you know I'm gonna leave it up for for a bit. Um, all right, so Nick, just want to thank you again um, for taking the time to to share with us. Um, it's just really helpful. I think people, yeah, people really enjoyed it. Uh, I just want to ask if you have any any final thoughts, advice, or I don't know, just encouragement that you want to leave with with the audience. Yeah, you know, just just explore things, have fun. Uh, uh, I definitely find uh, I'm more motivated when I find something interesting. I think a lot of people are like that. Um, uh, I I'll, I'll say I'm terrible at creating projects. So I and I work in open source. So I tend to like if I'm trying to learn something, I'll go find a project that's using whatever technology stack I want to learn. And that, like, that's how I learned React. I just started contributing to a repository that I found. Um, yeah, keep learning. Uh, never be shy to ask questions. There's, there's tons of great people out there, you know, that are willing to help. But, but be, you know, 
be kind and be mindful of people's time, but there's there's tons of people out there and great communities to to help everybody and lift each other up.